Yo, what's good, YouTube? Welcome back. It's your boy Skylar, and today we got some rally car racing content. My last one I did, I was reading through the comments. Everyone was like, check out Group B. So here we are. I hope you guys enjoy it. As always, please leave a like, comment, subscribe. Oh, uh, my goal is 10K. I'm at what? 7.6. For the love of God, please. Damn. I wouldn't let you guys down. So here we are. Hope you guys enjoy. And yeah, let's get it. The Audi Quattro, Lancia 037, and the Peugeot 205 T16, some of the most iconic names oh my God. in rallying. Cars that push the limits Move of the out scene, the some way. of the most iconic names in rallying. Cars that Move. push the limits of what was possible in a way that we haven't seen since. It was called Group B and is still held as the golden era of rallying. Group B was a class where manufacturers were allowed to go all out with almost unlimited power, crazy aerodynamics and new exotic materials. Now it brought this, about new technology. Now this is what car, like if you're a guy that's into cars, now this is what it's all about. Manufacturers, not like Ferrari. Oh, we're going to sue you if you mod a car, if you can do this to your car. Ferrari, yeah, bro, come on. But manufacturers you know what do what you want blow it up do what you want have fun yeah that's what it's all about bro technologies like four-wheel drive semi-automatic gearboxes and clever turbocharging systems however it was only for the bravest of drivers the hugely powerful cars needed Damn. a lot of manhandling to thread them through the tight twisty stages away from huge drops and dodging a sea of spectators but how did this come about? And what can we learn from the crazy cars that won in the Group B era? Rallying went wild in the 80s. The FIA oh wanted God. to find more manufacturers and so created a class that would give the designers pretty much free reign. No power limits, no regulations on boost and whatever exotic materials you liked. Rally cars over the years have been largely based on road cars with rules tightening and loosening on how close the relationship has to be between the stock mm. car and the ones that actually race the stage. For example, in the Group A class, the manufacturers have to produce 5,000 road going versions of the car before it is allowed to compete. In what? Group B, to lower the costs and interest of manufacturers. That's a lot, 5,000 just to be able to like be like all right it's qualified now damn that's a lot it is allowed to compete in group b to lower the costs and interest of manufacturers they ruled that only 200 cars needed to be produced group b mm. also allowed almost Reasonable. endless modifications to be made meaning the rally cars were nothing like the road cars at all this approach really worked attracting many manufacturers to group b names like lancia porsche Peugeot, Audi, Toyota, Ford, as well as so many more. Lancia took Damn. the Drivers' Championship in the first year of Group B with the 037. It was the last rear-wheel drive car to win in the WRC. It was incredibly light using fiberglass. I know you guys like like these type of content. I know you guys probably heard about DDE. Listen, watch this. Just like in my head, it's like DDE, but just like literally only like exotic like cars. That's that's really interesting, bro. I never know like rally card been going on like all this stuff because you have to really think like for me being from like the Caribbean, like the islands, like I never knew like all this stuff. So all this stuff is like kind of like, new to me. So it's kind of like interesting, like realizing like, damn, I've been missing out all this time. And Kevlar for the body and was powered by a mid-mounted 250 horsepower engine. It has much larger wings than many cars. Someone just got hit 1000%. With a huge to stabilize the car at high speeds. It was supercharged to avoid turbo lag and it was incredibly quick on the tarmac stage. Oh my god. However, it wasn't quite as quick on loose surfaces. So in stepped Audi with the Quattro, one of the most innovative rally cars of all time, a true game changer. Oh my god. It had an inline five engine with a very clever turbocharging system that produced over 450 brake horsepower. It had a small valve that kept the turbo spooled even when off throttle, meaning there was you might say like, oh, 400 horsepower, that's not a lot. But yeah, like the car itself probably doesn't even weigh, weigh that much. Probably like 2,000 pounds max. Like, you know, it's completely gutted. So it's like the power to weight ratio makes the car makes the most difference. You feel me? So like a thousand horsepower in a Lamborghini, this might literally like <laughs> leave it in dust. 
so it's very little turbo lag, making the car quick out of the tight turns. The Audi also had a very aggressive aero kit with a huge spoiler at the front of the car and an even bigger wing on the back. This was one of the first sophisticated uses of aerodynamics in rallying. Drivers said it made the car extremely stable at high speed. The insane power was put through a clever semi-automatic gearbox Damn. and drove all four wheels. It was the first car to use a four-wheel drive system effectively. Before this, many Ooh. manufacturers stuck to rear-wheel drive as they thought the additional weight would outweigh any time gains from the extra traction. And yes, the Audi was very heavy, and the four-wheel drive system meant the weight was higher up than you would like exactly. in a rally car normally. But despite the compromised dynamics, it worked. The Audi had more power than the rest of the field, but could also use it more effectively, Ooh. deploying more power even on surfaces like gravel, dirt, and ice. Audi won its first race with the car and didn't really stop after that. They shaved the seconds, if not minutes, off stage times. The Audi four-wheel drive system really changed the game in rallying. But That's the Audi sick. dominance didn't last long. Peugeot came out with a car that would expose the weaknesses of the Quattro. They used a similar four-wheel drive system but packaged it very differently. Their secret was that they really nailed the car's dynamics. They built the mm. car to look like the road-going 205, a small hatchback. It had a very short wheelbase, which generally makes cars more nimble at low speeds with the trade-off of less stability at high speeds. However, rally stage... They don't close off the tracks. Okay, he just literally dodge like a herd or a group of cows whatever you want to call it right and he just continued like nothing happened <laughs> they don't close it off it's just like okay just obstacles you just have to like deal with like what type of shit it is often so tight and twisty that this strategy paid off for persia they also did everything they could to keep the weight central. They fitted a 1.8 litre engine in the middle of the car, although it didn't have the clever anti-lag system that the Audi did. Mm. So the drivers used an old trick to keep the turbo spooled up. They left foot braked for the corners while staying on the throttle. This kept the turbo spooled up and gave them immediate power on the exit. But so what was really unusual about the 205 was the orientation they mounted the engine in. Normally, race cars have longitudinal mounted engines with the crank parallel with the direction of the car. However, Peugeot fitted it in a transverse orientation and instead of mounting the gearbox below the engine like okay. in the Audi, Peugeot mounted it to the side. This meant that the majority of the weight in the car was between the two axles and could be mounted lower, making the car much more nimble and responsive in the corners. Low center of gravity means the car doesn't roll too much, and if it's in the center of the chassis, the car is easier to rotate in the corners. The little the details the make the biggest difference. 50 50 though, it placed around 60% of the weight on the rear wheels. In simple terms, rearward weight distribution promotes oversteer and frontward weight distribution creates more understeer. This rearward bias meant the car was easier to turn in and control through the turns. You can really see this if you watch the Audi through the corners. The Audi was very front heavy and produced yeah. a lot of understeer. The drivers are trying to neutralize this with the throttle, but they have to correct the car several times through the corner. The Quattro understeers, then oversteers, then understeers again through a turn. The drivers really have to wrestle it through the corner. The Quattro was by no means an easy car it's to drive. Like. Now look at the <laughs> Peugeot. There is one smooth input on the steering and the car looks much more balanced and easy to drive. There is well, no wonder sliding. it's quicker. It's incredible to watch as these drivers control the car when at crazy speeds on tight and twisty rally stages. Also not forgetting they are threading the car through a sea of spectators on the stage. That's what but I'm why saying. are the fans allowed to be so close to the cars? The stages are public roads, meaning anyone could go and spectate. However, it mm. meant that many got extremely close to the cars. Back then, people... Which is stupid, though. I know it's your life and whatnot, but it's like, at the same time, you're putting the drivers at risk. You feel me? Like, okay, you don't care about your life, but think about the driver as well. What if he hit you? You traumatize that driver for life. You feel me? And it's kind of like... Like, get out the road. Like, why are you in the road? Okay, you're on the side, you're close, whatever it is. But get out the road. Don't stand in the road, bro. 
people did get hit, but it was considered to be part of the challenge for the drivers. They often kept it pinned and had to hope that the fans would get out of the way in time. This guy even had to jump over a passing car. Many manufacturers understood that Peugeot's mm -hmm. approach was the way to go, all producing smaller, short wheelbase cars with all the weight in the middle. MG created the Metro with a distinctive boxy shape and a huge front wing, and the Renault 5 took a similar approach too. However, it was Lance. I don't like every time we see like cars like this, like the front end, someone like this. This is like I don't know why it does. It does give me like Japan, like a Japan vibes, like a Japanese like themed kind of car. I don't know why. However, it was maybe Lance the rally lights the best. They finally scrapped real world drive after being uncompetitive all year. So they created the Lancia Delta S4, a short wheelbase four wheel drive monster. Firstly, they developed an engine with a genius twin charging system. They fitted a supercharger to avoid the lag of a turbo, a bit like the Lancia 037. However, this created less power at high revs. As a supercharger is directly driven by the engine, it can provide boost at low revs, but saps more and more power as the revs climb. Shoot. So what Lancia did was fit an additional turbocharger that would provide boost at high revs. So low end boost was provided by the supercharger before cutting out and letting the turbo take over at higher revs. What? This meant the Delta S4 was amazingly powerful and had to, grip to put it down onto the stage. It took many wins before eventually bringing the Group B era to a close. This era of rallying was amazing to watch. Incredibly fast cars and amazing drivers all pushing to the limits of what's possible. There were different winners every year and cars that looked remarkably different with incredible engineering. However, you can't ignore the fact that it was all this before dangerous. I was even the born. Cars were too That's powerful, crazy. Difficult to drive and not enough emphasis was put on the safety of drivers See. and spectators. The biggest issue was the minimum weight rule. Cars could weigh as little as 890 kilograms. So to be competitive, manufacturers would do anything they could to get this limit down. This created a breed of cars that were very fragile and not up to the job of protecting drivers oh my in gosh. a crash. Many of the drivers explained that if this weight limit was higher, more strengthening could have been added to better protect the drivers in a crash. Several huge crashes happened. In Portugal, Santos crested a rise in his Ford RS200. He lost control and went off the course, horrifically oh injuring 31 spectators and Exactly my point, bro. If your ass was not in the way, you would 31 of y'all wouldn't have been hurt. You feel me? Stay stay your ass out the road. You have you might happen to tell grown adults and to not play in a row, to not stand in the road. Like, come on, bro. <laughs> Killing three. All the teams immediately pulled out of the rally and it left Group B hanging on by a thread. A few months later, the final blow came. Lancia's Henry Toivonen was the championship favorite when he lost control late in a fast turn. He was winning by a huge margin when he and his co-driver Sergio Cresto came flying off the road, heading down a steep hill. The impact ruptured the fuel oh tank, spilling God. fuel over the red hot turbocharger, sending the car up in flames. After the incident, it was barely recognizable as a car and both Henry and Sergio were killed in the crash. This led to many manufacturers pulling out and the FIA ended the group Damn, being crashed the following year. You should watch this video where I explain what it takes. I was going to ask how it ended too. I'm glad y'all told me to check this out. This explains a whole lot to me and I appreciate it. I hope you guys enjoy it as well. Please, as always, like, subscribe and come back for the next one. All right? Peace.